Hello, I'm Chris McCarthy from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from the ACS Fall 2019 National Meeting in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Karen Woolley, Dr. Jody Luckenhaus, and Tan Wen from Texas A&M University. They're studying protein batteries for safer, environmentally friendly power storage. Dr. Luckenhaus? Hi, thank you for your interest, and it's a pleasure to share this work um, that we've done together with, with you. So batteries are everywhere. I'm sure you're probably carrying two or three right now. And continued growth in battery consumption is expected as we increase our dependence on electronics and electric vehicles, especially with more regulations coming down the pipeline in Europe towards electric vehicles. And so this uh, slide is showing in the bottom right that the lithium ion battery demand is expected to grow, particularly in the sectors of uh, grid scale energy storage and, and electric vehicles. But there's an issue with that because we need to consider the materials that go into these batteries. Some of these materials come from uh, geopolitically sensitive areas, um, are not necessarily um, sustainable. On top of that, we also have new batteries in new places where we're not used to having them. One is the idea of flexible electronics for like a flexible cell phone. Also, um, biometrics, these are like data tattoos or wearable sensors for the healthcare industry. And then also there's a new concept emerging in electric vehicles called structural energy and power where you could um, have a lithium ion battery that has the same mechanical properties as a structural composite. So these batteries could be the, the door of a car or the hood of a car. And so we asked the question, what's going to power these new types of batteries? And today's lithium ion batteries really aren't going, going to work in these, uh, in these venues. So applications of the future require batteries of the future. And we envision new types of batteries that are safe, recyclable, responsibly sourced, and also they can be integrated into a circular economy. In fact, today's lithium ion batteries are not part of a circular economy. Only 5% of lithium ion batteries are actually recycled. So our vision with our team with Karen Woolley and Tan Nguyen is that we are designing batteries that come from nature. These are um, starting with amino acids. These are the same types of uh, chemical molecules that you can find in your body. We polymerize them into uh, peptides, and then we hack the peptide with a redox active uh, group that allows you to store energy. And so what we've done is we have these hacked peptides that can act as the components in a battery. They can act as the cathode and the anode. And even better, is that these are all organic, they don't need to contain a metal, and you can recover them by two ways. One is simply when you're done with the battery, you can just recycle it. You can recover the material and potentially put it back into a new battery. And then the other way we're working on is that these um, uh, peptides can be naturally degradable. And you could degrade them back into their amino acids and potentially uh, reuse them for a different application or for synthesizing them back into a, a fresh new peptide. All right, so that's our, that's our vision. Thank you. Are there any questions? And please state your name and affiliation before we ask your question, or before asking your question. Thank you. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Can you say a little bit more about these redox active molecules? I think you mentioned Tempo and Viologens and maybe something about the expense of those and also about um, how they work and what's special about them. Thanks. So I, I think I can answer that question. <clears throat> so the cathode is made up a like, um, Tempo containing polypeptide and the anode is made up of virogen containing polypeptide. The way it's, the, the battery is working is that um, during charging, the tempo in the cathode got oxidized to the oxoammonium cation. It releases electron into the anode and reducing the virogen 
from the two plus species to zero uh, to the neutral species, and during this charging um, process, um, the process is going backward in the way that the virogen in the cat in the anode uh, got oxidized back into the um, original virogen species, a two plus species, releasing the electron from the um, anode to the cathode and regenerate the temp the oxo ammonium cation back into the um, temple radical species. And then about the expenses of the material, so um, the synthesis of the material are right now are quite expensive, and it will require us like some more times to make it like more affordable. Do you have any thoughts on how you might reduce the costs? Um. I'm gonna Karen's this synthetic yeah. expert. Yeah, so um, typically as um, scale increases, price decreases, and so we anticipate that if this were to um, be realized into a, a commercial device, that there would be opportunities for decreased cost through uh, increased scale of, of the materials. They're, they're not difficult to synthesize, they're not difficult to acquire. Uh, the Tempo um, moiety is used extensively. It's a, it's a stable free radical, it's uh, readily available, it's, it's safe, it's used in, in fact as a probe for studying things like proteins and other biomacromolecules. So our key interest uh, in this work is um, actually twofold. One is to build these molecules, maybe they're too expensive now, but build them in such a way as we can understand fundamentally the rules that are involved in placing these redox active moieties within three-dimensional space on a polypeptide backbone where that polypeptide backbone uh, secondary structure, just like a, in the folding of a protein, it places the, the moieties in, in particular orientations. So we want to understand the rules involved in that and how well electron transfer can occur uh, within uh, these frameworks as a function of the placement of the moieties. The, the second aspect of uh, what we want to do is we want to create uh, materials that can impact society in positive ways. We, we feel strongly that having safer and degradable and recyclable battery materials that could be used, say, in implantable uh, devices or even in, in um, vehicles uh, are important for the environment, they're important for um, human health. And um, just to ask about the, um, the output of these devices as well, I think it mentions in the release that you've got um, 1.5 volts so far. Um, what ways do you think envisage, I mean, do you think you'll be able to get much significantly higher output? Because you were talking about the main areas of need would be electric vehicles and grid applications. Yeah, def definitely. Um, as this was our first attempt to kind of hack these peptides with redox active groups, we chose ones that we knew really well, that were easy to work with. And there is a whole family of these groups out there that have tunable potentials, tunable energy storage properties. And so um, my view is that this is the beginning of a mix and match approach where you can mix different peptides with different structures, mix different redox groups to get exactly the potential you want and the energy storage properties you want. So this is, what I see, this is just the beginning. Okay, thank you. Hi, Katie Cottingham from the American Chemical Society. So um, would a protein battery recharge as quickly as a lithium ion battery? Um, how does that compare? So you know about the charging. Yeah, yeah, so I'll, co I'll come in on that. Um, so uh, I, first I can speak generally about redox active polymers since most people aren't familiar with them. One of the really cool things about redox active polymers is that they can charge much faster than regular lithium ion batteries. And uh, one of, for example, one of the molecules I work with can charge in minutes rather than hours. So these materials that we work with has the, the potential, excuse the pun, to <laughs> recharge um, just as quickly. And um, then, it become, then it gets into kind of an engineering approach of how do you arrange the molecules inside the electrode so that all these groups can connect together for the fast charging. But I think the potential is there to be in minutes. 
This is Laura Cassidy with the American Chemical Society. How does the size of a protein battery compare to some more lithium ion batteries? <clears throat> so, uh, right now, the amount of energy that we can store is not as much. So if you wanted to store the same amount of energy, our batteries would have to be a few times bigger. And that gets back to the idea of if we can change those groups and mix and match uh, groups that are, have higher potential or have some more redox activity, I think we can reduce the size even more. Uh, Bill Buslig, ACS. Um, your redox are active mo molecules, are, are viologens or, or, or tempo, uh, as I understand. Uh, they're both exceedingly toxic. Uh, what do you do uh, do uh, to uh, what, uh, during recycling to uh, to prevent any kind of a problem because of it? And, and uh, I have a second question, which has to do with the density, but let's, let's address the, the toxicity problem first. So, so I don't know about the toxicity of the biologen, but the tempo is not actually exceedingly toxic. And um, if we were to find that there would be issues with the toxicity of the biologen, again, we have alternative uh, redox active moieties that could be well, used. This, at this point, is a fundamental study to understand the placement of these groups in, in space with respect to one another to determine the electron transfer efficiencies. Well, I was, uh, I was referring to one of the uh, best-known biologians uh, uh, being toxic paraquat. And that, uh, uh, that's something uh, that, that's been implicated in all kinds of prob uh, problems, uh, you know, Diseases that uh, that currently have very low uh, cures. Uh, so when you're recycling the the thing, and uh, are you be able to hang on to the uh, the uh, the biologen molecule and 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 without any kind of release into the into the environment? So, so you do make a good point. Um, in the degradation scheme, where, where the batteries would be disposed of and they would degrade in the environment, we would not have an ability to capture the, the biologen. Uh, but in a recycling uh, scheme, we would be able to, because uh, there are two different strategies. We can either just dismantle the battery and recover the polypeptides intact, or we can degrade them. And in that case, then we still would capture each of the degradation uh, products. Now, at the moment, how, do, uh, how does the, the redox battery, battery of this sort uh, compare to the, uh, the available, let's say, lithium-ion ba uh, batteries for current density, for example? Yeah. We, we still have a ways to go. Um, I, I get think, in general, that's one of the exciting parts of research is you start off with a vision, with our vision of this uh, recyclable metal-free battery and I could see us working on this for years to eventually get there. So no. right now it's not, right now it's not, you're not gonna replace a lithium battery with this right now, but it's what motivates us to do the work. Thank you. Uh, hi, Katrina Kramer from Chemistry World. Um, you mentioned that the uh, spatial arrangement is important to how the energy transfer works. So do you design the polypeptide in a specific way? Like how long is each chain? Or could you just use um, a natural protein that already has an arrangement of polypeptides? Um, the answer is yes. We can control the 3D dimension of the um, polypeptide. We can make it into like alpha helixes or like random coil, poly random coil polypeptide and compare the kinetic inside of the, the, the polymer. And at the same time, we can also vary like the degree of polymerization of each of the polymer as well as like controlling the, the distance between um, the, um, the, the backbone to the um, side chain. So those 3D dimensions we can control into look deeper like into how the 3D space, spacing of those materials can affect the performance of the battery in the future. Right, do, so do you have any preliminary results like that tells you which arrangement is the best? Those are un, um, undergoing right now. We just synthesized a, a library of different polymer and it's ready for testing in the next few months. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS 2019 San Diego. And please join us for our next press conference at 11 a.m. today on a new way to bump off ticks by drying up their saliva. Thank you. <laughs>